a quarter million people of all colors, genders, and ages traveled to the nation's capital on an August Wednesday, 1963, to march peacefully for economic equality and civil rights. It's most remembered now for being the moment when the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. delivered the I Have a Dream speech, now recited by school children everywhere. For this month's Smithsonian Magazine, Washington Post reporter Michael Fletcher interviewed some of the people who were there. We talked about what else happened that day. They came by plane, train, automobile, bus, and on foot to be part of the March on Washington. An estimated 250,000 people converged on the Lincoln Memorial on that hot August day 50 years ago this month. Michael, people forget that it was really hard to get that many people in one place in 1963. Right. How, did, how did the march come together? Well, it's interesting. I mean, the idea for the march actually had been planted 22 years before it occurred. A. Philip Randolph, the famous uh, labor leader, had wanted to have a march on Washington at that time to protest discrimination in the war industries in the United States and segregation of the armed forces. But that was forestalled when FDR desegregated the war industry. So the march wasn't held, but then 22 years later, here we are in the, in, in the aftermath of the murder of Medgar Evers. The Civil Rights Bill had just been introduced, and he felt like it's a time, this, now is the time for people to converge on Washington and make this demand. But it was an audacious idea, because in those days, marches on Washington just didn't happen. Mass marches didn't happen. That was something that had never been used as a political tool in this country. Marches in those days, they, they attracted 10,000 people. That was big. So this was a big, audacious idea, and it was pulled together, really, in eight or 10 weeks. One person you mentioned, A. Mm -hmm. Philip Randolph, right. and another person who was behind the organization, Bayard Rustin. Bayard Rustin was the key. People say he's a master organizer. And what a controversial figure. Back in 1963, this is an openly gay black man who's at the center of the civil rights movement. And he was attacked, of course. People in Congress attacked him. Strom Thurmond, you know, talked about his lifestyle in, in, in a way to try to undermine the planning for the march, but it was Bayard Rustin who brought the logistics together. He did all of the organizing. He got word out to, to various organizations around the country. And again, 1963, no email, you know, everything's snail mail. But he was able to organize the march and bring people to Washington. And again, no one knew that it would end up being a quarter million people because you, know, you, just, you just had no way to know this kind of thing. But, and the but faces the in the crowd, the faces were not just black faces. It wasn't like someone got up in black church pulpits and said, you go to Washington. There, I was struck looking at the pictures now, how integrated it was. And that was one of the great triumphs of the march, because we think of the civil rights movement now, we sort of think back and say, oh, you know, we think of the Freedom Summers, we think about this integrated kind of um, movement in some ways, but at that time, I think there were a lot of questions in America about what, what is the civil rights movement. It felt kind of threatening and it felt like a black southern movement. And the march, I think, kind of brought it into focus for most Americans and really for a global audience. And it brought it together in a way that it was an American movement. It was kind of this revolution. And the integrated nature of the march, I think, really helped that along. And yet, the Kennedy administration was nervous enough about the potential for violence in a march of this type that the president and the attorney general were like, I don't know if this is a good idea. And in fact, he had some of these leaders into the White House. Yeah, he did. And, and think of it, they had to march on a Wednesday. They, they closed all the liquor stores in D.C. They had um, Army Reserves on notice and ready to come into the city if, if things had turned violent. And, and Kennedy didn't know what to make of it, let's face it. I mean, he was worried that, you know, all these people are coming to Washington again. You know, a march is an unheard of kind of phenomenon in those days. So he wanted to be kind of hands off. But it's interesting, after the march, he had the leaders come back to the White House and he congratulated them on, on the great success. President Kennedy invited us back down to the White House. He stood in the door of the Oval Office and he greeted each one of us, shook our hands. He was like a beaming, proud father. You could see it all over him. He was so happy and so pleased that everything had gone so well. In your piece for Smithsonian, you talked to a lot of folks who were there that day and, in, and some people who spoke. Um, how did they look back on that march now with 50 years advantage? Well, it's, it's interesting. Like, well, looking back now, like if they take that 50 year kind of retrospective, everyone sees it as this kind of pivotal moment in the civil rights movement. The moment when the civil rights movement kind of grew into kind of an international human rights kind of movement and not just a regional kind of race-based kind of thing. It was something that kind of 
you know, prick the American conscience in a way. And you know, John Lewis at the time, his famous speech at the march watered down because of um, concern that it was too radical. You know, he talked about the Civil Rights Bill not being, you know, not going far enough. So at the time, there was a lot of, you know, there was a normal kind of tensions you get in the moment, but, you know, with the advantage of time, looking back a half a century, everyone says, like, this was a, just an astounding moment. When we look back at the uh, conversations that went on leading up to this march and, and the coverage since, it's almost all been about the I Have a Dream speech. Right. Uh, you mentioned John Lewis's radical yeah. uh, speech, which even watered down was pretty tough. Right. But not so much, that's not how it's been remembered. No, it's interesting. Uh, you know, people obviously talk about, you know, um, Dr. King's speech and everyone remembers I Have a Dream, but the original notion for the march was a, a march for jobs and a march for kind of economic justice. And the freedom part almost got added on as a result of the Civil Rights Bill and, of course, the assassination of Medgar Evers. So it was almost a secondary thing. And now it's become this, the thing that everyone remembers. And interestingly, another thing people say when they look back, they say that's the part of the agenda that, that, has, that has not been fulfilled. You look at disparities, economic disparities in this country, they remain. You know, African Americans obviously have made great progress and we're sitting on this set. But, you know, you still have huge disparities in terms of income, in terms of unemployment rates. They're almost identical to what they were back in 1963. And even Dr. King's speech, he spoke about a, a promissory note. He talked about what Americans were owed. He wasn't just talking about integration. Oh, no, not at all. He was talking about economic justice, and you saw where he went, you know, in the years following the march, the Poor People's Campaign and all of that, and, and his efforts to try to, you know, lift so many, you know, African Americans and others out of poverty. That was his focus. Um, Bayard Rustin talked a lot about that. He, he wrote a piece shortly after the march saying that the roots of discrimination are economic. And in uh, the economy, the economy of this country has to shift for the real reality of people's lives to be, to be changed. Looking back now, 50 years later, there is a, there's an entire generation, a couple of generations of people who are going down to the mall and looking at the Martin Luther King Memorial uh, and the only uh, monument in Washington to a non-elected official, and he's a black man. And a lot of emotion is tied up in, in that, in the very fact of its existence. 50 years later, though, if King were able to stand in that spot and look out, what is the legacy of that day that uh, some people say we have a black president, everything's much better, and some people say we have so much farther to go. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think it's mixed. You know, of course, I mean, you can, there's no way to diminish the, the sort of the, the, the astounding sort of sense of having a black president. That would have been unthinkable. Imagine someone saying that from the speaker's podium, you know, in 1963 would have been like, oh, that's a great dream. But, you know, here we are. It's a reality. So that's part of the legacy. I mean, there's been obviously great growth in the black middle class. You see African Americans doing all kinds of things in all walks of life. So that's part of the legacy. But you still have this, you know, 27 percent roughly of African Americans living in poverty. That's huge. And that hasn't improved that much over the last, you know, 30 or 40 years. There was great improvement through the 60s. But after that, that, that progress slowed. So that's part of the legacy. There are these, you know, there's been great progress in education, but not enough. That's part of the legacy. You can go in any inner city and look at the housing. You'll, see, you'll have you know, prosperous African-American communities and poor ones. So all of that, you ha kind of have this mixed legacy. And I, and I think it speaks to the need for kind of the struggle to continue. This has been one of the great days of America. And I think this march will go down as one of the greatest, if not the greatest, uh, demonstrations for freedom and human dignity ever held in the United States.